Hi, this is Eloy Ortiz Oakley, and welcome back to The Rant, the podcast where we pull back the curtain and break down the people, the policies, and the politics of our higher education system. In this episode, we talk money, federal money flowing to states and communities throughout this country, and how post-secondary education institutions should be thinking about putting that money to work. We're going to be talking about the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, billions and billions of dollars allocated to begin flowing to states to improve our infrastructure, to improve our semiconductor capacity. And through all that, we will need a great workforce to be able to fill those jobs. So with me today is Matt Gandahl, President and CEO of Education Strategy Group, ESG. They are a consulting firm that's helping states and communities and educational institutions throughout the country think about how to make better and greater connections between education and the workforce. So they're well positioned to help policymakers and institutional leaders think about how to put this money to work. Matt has great experience in higher education, including spending time as a senior advisor to Secretary of Education Arne Duncan in the Obama administration. He and his team are leading great work across the country. So if you enjoy this episode, please hit the like button, continue to follow us on this YouTube channel, and of course, on all of your favorite podcast platforms. So let's jump right into the interview. Matt, welcome to the Rant Podcast. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here, Eloy. Well, it's great to have you. I appreciate the work that you're leading. And, you know, you and I have known each other for for quite some time, and you've worn many different hats, including working at the Department of Education as a senior advisor to Arnie Duncan, you've worked uh, on all different types of issues in higher education. So I appreciate the work that you're leading over there at uh, ESG. There's a lot going on right now, particularly as states and communities think about how to get the resources that the federal government is creating through the CHIPS Act, through the Infrastructure Act, through all this work happening at the Department of Labor, highlighting apprenticeships. So as As you do your work, and I know that every mayor or governor that I run into is focused on this issue of creating good jobs and of getting the workforce to have the skills necessary, the training necessary that people need to fill these jobs, Uh, particularly in this economy that's changing every day. AI is beginning to, to have an impact on the economy. So in the work that you're leading at ESG, what are you seeing? in states and communities that you're working in, in terms of the kinds of practices or policies that um, are making a difference in terms of making that critical connection between skills and jobs? Well, thanks, Eloy. I mean, as you know, my throughout my career, I've been focused on whether it was at the federal level or nonprofits or now leading a, a, a major uh, consulting firm, at the intersections between our education system and what comes next for learners and the barriers uh, that have been erected intentionally or unintentionally in this Mm -hmm. country that keep so many from realizing those dreams. And you're putting your finger on exactly the issue that we're seeing everywhere right now, which is elected officials um, responding to the the, the pressures uh, to focus on the economy, to grow the economy, whether it's at the national level, at the certainly at the state level with governors and at the local level with mayors and city councils and and a lot of action there. If you're a, you know, elected official, it's a win to bring new jobs into your community or into your st- company to build the new plant in your community. And now we see the federal government, as you say, uh, investing billions, um, through the chips act, the infrastructure bill and, and the like in job creation. What we're seeing is an opportunity, but not yet fully realized for education systems, mainly higher education, but arguably K-12 as well, to be positioning themselves to help uh, create a talent pipeline. Um, and we, we're doing a lot of work around the country uh, that's focused on that, and we see a lot of room for improvement. You, you, you know, we'll come back to maybe the federal investments in a little bit, but you just look at the state and local level, uh, a lot of action right now on focusing on career readiness, focusing on career pathways, mm-hmm. 
good news. A lot of policies are being passed. Legislatures are moving policies forward at the high school level, certainly at the college level. They create more of an emphasis on preparing learners for um, good jobs in, you know, careers that can be create family sustaining wages, allow for upward mobility. And what we've learned a lot in our work about what it takes for education systems to position themselves to help develop that talent and create opportunity for young people, particularly for people who have been underserved in the mm -hmm. past uh, by our school. So it's an exciting time. This is happening in red and blue states. Right. Uh, this is really bipartisan or nonpartisan. And we're seeing a lot of energy around this right now everywhere. Let's talk about a couple of a couple of states, one red and one blue. We'll talk about my home state here in California, clearly blue, and my uh, second home, the state of Texas, the Republic of Texas. So in spite of all of the rhetoric, or the national rhetoric, the political rhetoric, both states are really focused on building a workforce pipeline. Here in California, Governor Gavin Newsom issued a call to create a new master plan for career education, called on the three uh, public segments of higher education to bring new focus on creating those career connections uh, and being very intentional about that, working with employers, um, asking the state to increase the number of apprenticeships. And he's very high on the Singapore model, which is very much workforce uh, focused. And then, of course, in the state of Texas, you've had a number of initiatives, including some reforms to the funding for community colleges so that outcomes are front and center, particularly career outcomes. So as you're navigating both the, the national uh, rhetoric and, and the work that's happening on the ground, um, what do you see as promising in some of those state policies and are they driving down to communities yet? Yes, definitely some promising state policies and, and some really great action at the local level, not, not everywhere, but it's right. getting there. So, uh, California certainly I know has, has invested a lot in pathways and in career readiness. And I know a lot of efforts over the last couple of years in investing in higher education and positioning higher education to be uh, good partners on the economic development, economic mobility side, even regional investments, I understand that have been made across the regions in California. And that's really important. We're seeing in a variety of states, a lot of work on redesigning high school. So right. high school is about now, I think in the places that are innovating uh, about college and career, and there's mm -hmm. a legitimate effort to build career pathways with the knowledge that it generally has to go to and through higher education, uh, that, that a high school diploma is not sufficient uh, to get well-paying jobs in America today. So most of the career work we're seeing going on in high schools involves transitions into post-secondary and then ultimately into careers. And a lot of the best work is really anchored in understanding the labor market needs in states and in regions and mm -hmm. which, which credentials are needed to get the best jobs. So probably a, a fair amount of work in the high school space. And then, you know, on the, on the college side and the higher ed side, we're also seeing some activity. So you mentioned Texas, probably one of the uh, more ambitious states right now that's redesigning mm -hmm. their higher education system to be more kind of tied to the economic goals of the state and the, re in the regions across the state. And primarily by, as you know, when they passed H Bill HB8 there, last year, House Bill 8, um, they redesigned the way that community colleges would be funded to be outcomes-based funding uh, with a particular look at the economic needs of the state and the regions in the state. And at least the state portion of the funding, the majority of it would be based on the number, the number of students who earn credentials of value rather than the number of learners who are in, mm -hmm. you know, enrolled. Uh, so shifting to outcomes right. from enrollment based with an eye toward credentials of value. I think we're seeing this idea of defining credentials of value, gaining a lot of traction uh, in states across the U.S. It opens up a lot of interesting conversations about uh, what do you mean by value? How do you tie it to earnings potential? How do you measure that? How do you make sure you're able to measure non-degree credentials and short-term credentials in the mix? All of which will be really, really important if uh, short-term Pell passes and we, we start to open up federal 
funding for shorter term credentials. So Texas is a state to watch in terms of looking at the funding model and really emphasizing credentials of value. And interestingly, their their colleges, particularly the community college systems uh, and institutions were very much behind this legislation. So very interesting to watch that. Another state I'll mention on the, on the um, blue side is, is Michigan, mm -hmm. a state where the economy has really been transformed, uh, where the auto industry is going through transformation, where um, they recognized that they set a goal for the percentage of adults they wanted or young people and adults they wanted to have a post-secondary credential in Michigan, the, the governor did. And they realized pretty quickly that the only way they were going to get there is to focus much more on adults. Right. not just traditional age uh, students. So Michigan has, we think, been an exemplar in having a state strategy around adult learners in higher education tied to their economic goals. During the pandemic, they used um, federal relief funds to launch something called Futures for Frontliners, which was essentially a uh, free community college for adults who went into pathways in essential industries. Mm -hmm. And they ended it via something called Mich Michigan Reconnect, which is like a number of other states have done free, you know, tuition for community college for Michiganders over the age of 25. Then they lowered the age down to 21. And then interestingly, last session a year ago, they put some money aside for grants for actual colleges to up their game on how they serve adult learners. And then they created a, a special center, a research center to be the experts on how colleges can better work with um, learners, of, you know, above the traditional age, since we know there's a lot of uh, different approaches we need to adopt to effectively serve those learners. And those learners are becoming a bigger and bigger proportion of college population and certainly the population that colleges can and should attract into their institutions. It, it piques my interest when people talk about what is a traditional student today, because uh, based on the data I see, it's over 60% of the, of the learners in higher ed right now are over the age of 24. And so I think you're right on that colleges, universities need to look at these learners that are working that have not been able to uh, go full-time or have not been able to find the right post-secondary experience. I think those colleges, universities that can master that, that can offer something to this population of learners will benefit in the long run. And the economic outcome is a big piece of what they're looking for. They, they want economic mobility on the other side of that learning. So you mentioned something that's in the news quite a bit today, short-term Pell. And uh, I can't help but ask you a couple of questions, given your experience in DC, given your ear to the ground there. There is this conversation happening around um, Credentials of value, lots of different opinions on what is a credential of value and whether or not there are credentials that actually create value enough so that the federal government should invest in them. There is a bipartisan effort right now, which is incredible to say that Representative Virginia Fox and Representative Bobby Scott are joined arm in arm in this push for short-term Pell. But there's a lot of pushback um, from different corners, whether it's those consumer advocates, which you know are all my friends, uh, but who really feel uh, extremely concerned that these short-term credentials don't create the kind of value that we want to see happen, all the way to the, um, the the wealthier institutions in this nation who feel concerned about how Congress is is planning to pay for this short-term Pell program. What what do you see happening, and do you see short-term Pell? as something that should and could benefit states uh, who are pushing on these efforts to get more and more of their workforce, more and more of their adult learners um, to gain access to, to skills that they need to participate in the economy? Yes, I do. I mean, despite the, the complexities of how you get it right, it's where we need to go uh, with the right protections put in place. And I say that because um, this is what learners want, um, we're increasingly seeing that, you know, not only adults, but even younger people in high school are more and more attracted to the idea of shorter term credentials, stacking those credentials over time, 
understanding the value proposition when they go and pay for a, any higher education, uh, what it's going to translate into over what period of time. And I understand we don't want to minimize everything down to that payoff question right. all the time. Frankly, that's where the American public is. Uh, <laughs> questions they're asking about higher ed more broadly. Uh, and I think we need to be responsive to them. And I was really am amazed to see some poll data recently to show that the, the younger generation is thinking this way as well about how much quickly can I earn a credential of value and not always thinking of it in a four-year span or even a two-year span. Mm -hmm. So really, that's where the energy is coming from the consumer side. Um, and I think, you know, if if we can figure out a way to position these federal funds to enable the, uh, the least advantage of our learners to get access to these credentials and make sure they're quality credentials, I think we'll do, be doing everyone a service. Now, to make sure they're quality, as you know, Congress has been grappling with, there has to be, you know, there have to be safeguards put in place. There has to be a bar and metrics put in place. But mm -hmm. this is exactly what states are wrestling with right now. So some of the states are ahead of the curve on already working to figure this out. I think if this uh, bipartisan agreement can kind of stick to a quality bar that looks at real return, uh, um, the return on the investment of these credentials and make right. sure that we're only allowing these funds to go that direction and not to credentials that are continuing to be dead ends and that aren't having the payoff or aren't stackable. I think it will do, it will be a positive. Now, how they pay for it and that the whole, you know, recent <laughs> set of proposals on that, I'm staying out of that one. I, <laughs> uh, where we're best positioned is to help folks figure out how to get it right in terms of the quality issues and how to respond to the, to the consumer demands in, in this country that are, are growing around this. Let's pivot back to money. There is a lot of money that the federal government has is putting into motion to uh, help the country, in, in the case of the CHIPS Act, help the country develop or redevelop the muscle it had to be able to increase its semiconductor capacity, to be able to fund and manufacture its own semiconductors, which during the pandemic we all saw was a big issue. You know, we had we had waiting lists for cars, for washing machines, for all sorts of household items that we didn't realize, a lot of people didn't realize, were delayed because of the limited access to semiconductors because they're all, were being manufactured in one part of the, one part of the world. So we wanted to bring it back on shore and there's a tremendous amount of investment happening. In order to create that semiconductor capacity, we know, particularly those of us, you and I, who've worked in higher ed a long time, it really depends on getting those resources to the post-secondary education providers that actually reach the kind of workers that we're going to need for this workforce. So in, in your experience, how are you seeing that, that imperative that th those resources flow or not flow yet? And have you picked up on anything that policymakers or employers or education and training providers should be thinking about in order to access those resources, but also to put those resources to work in states and communities. Yeah, the really important question, because there are the a lot of money uh, that, that is about to start flowing, not just out of the Chips, Chips and Science Act, that's uh, I think $280 billion. Right. We also have bipartisan infrastructure law, which is $1.2 trillion over five years. And then you have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is another $370 billion. That's a lot of dollars. It's a and lot of dollars. Right. And, and we're going to be hearing a lot more about that uh, in the months ahead. But what I don't think we're going to hear as much about and we need to is what's happening on the ground when these dollars, as you say, uh, reach their destination. Now, it's important to note that all of these dollars are going straight into industry, create the jobs. So while we would have liked to have seen some of those dollars flowing into education and into higher education to, you know, build the training programs and, uh, kind of improve the pathways and the pipeline, that's not where the money's flowing. Uh, so you ask this question and my answer is it really depends on the state and local actors mm -hmm. to ensure that when this money arrives, um, in these industry sectors across, you know. Uh, like you said, the CHIPS Act, 
going to semiconductor industry. You've got a lot of money in the transportation industry that's going to be flowing. You've got uh, a lot of money in the en energy energy industry, and that's right. coming out of the Department of Energy. Transportation's money coming out of the Department of Transportation. Chips Act is coming out of the Department of Commerce. So you have multiple agencies in the federal government sending mi millions, billions of dollars out straight to industry. What we're hearing is in some cases, higher ed is at the table and prepared. In other cases, they're not. And what we're encouraging, whether it's at a local level or at a state level where governors can actually set the table, is that frankly, higher education needs to be at the table everywhere. Higher education needs to be positioned to be partners in producing the talent. Because what I what, what we're concerned about is there are two scenarios that could play out here, Eli. One is the way we want it, which is the money flows, the industry, the jobs are created, the plants are built, jobs are created, and the planning had been done with higher education partners and other training partners. So by the time the jobs open up, there are enough people coming out of those local communities who can fill right. those jobs. Right. That's scenario A, and that's what we want to see. I'm concerned we could see scenario B, which is all the emphasis is put on creating the jobs, building the plants, getting everything ready, not enough emphasis on the local or regional talent supply. And by the time those jobs open up, there aren't enough people to fill them. And those companies are going to have to look elsewhere, either somewhere mm -hmm. else in the U.S. or frankly outside the U.S. to fill those jobs. You could just see how that narrative would be spun out and... I think the places where the higher education partners are there are planning forward with the employers, understand the employer needs, are partnering to develop, expand the programs, redirect resources to build programs that don't exist or scale them are going to be in the best position. But that's not, that's not the way things are being teed up if it's not intentionally driven that way by other leaders at the state and local level right now. So when you're talking to state and local leaders, your primary um, advice is begin to set that table now between the the supply side and the demand side, making sure that the education providers are at the table thinking about how they're going to uh, train individuals to fill those jobs and for the employers to be there to start talking uh, about the kind of workforce that they're going to need. Absolutely. Set that table, make sure the employers uh, understand the importance of having education partners at that table now and not waiting a few years to when the jobs are then available. And it, and we know, I mean, higher education generally isn't the most nimble institution. And this mm -hmm. creates frustration often with employers who want fast, uh, you know, talent. And it's just not possible in most higher education settings to turn on a dime. So have some lead time to work with institutions to provide talent at scale. That's the message that we all need to be sending. That's the message governors need to be sending, mayors need to be sending. We need, you know, we need that table to be set right now. Uh, the money is question when the money is flowing. I mean, some, some of it has flow, started flowing. A, a bunch of CHIPS Act money we expect to flow in the next two months. And then some of these other uh, dollars are gonna flow. I think a lot of them will start flowing uh, in the mid to later part of this year. So how do we get ahead of that curve? There are some places that have already got that table set and they've got the partnerships, like a couple examples we've seen in, in Ohio, we, in Columbus, Ohio, you got Columbus State Community College. Uh, as you know, they're you know one of, the, one of the leading community colleges in the country that thinks about these issues that already right. been partnering Intel and their four-year partners there to uh, build a talent partnership. In New York State, we see Micron Technologies working with the SUNY system um, mm -hmm. to in higher education talent pipeline and the, and the state is putting money on the table for that as well, all to kind of be in prepared to, to leverage these federal uh, resources. So, and we see, you know, outside of the federal dollars, we also see a movement in some states to try to start combining their agency efforts. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of this born out of our silos uh, that we, Frankly, we have the silos at the federal level, these departments I mentioned earlier, energy, transportation, labor, commerce, they're separate entities. They're separate from the Department of Education. They are collaborating, but probably not enough to ensure that all these 
things occur, you know, that I just described in terms of uh, talent and the, the supply and the demand side, some states are setting their own tables. So Indiana, the governor has a workforce table that, that he has set where the education, labor, commerce, higher ed and K-12 are all there working regularly together to try to mm -hmm. create this balance of supply and demand. Um, Missouri combined their agent, higher ed and workforce agencies or a few other states they're considering um, making moves like that. Michigan combined their uh, workforce and education agencies over the last couple of years. So I think I see a lot of political leaders trying to figure out how to create this table at the state level. I think the same thing needs to be done uh, at the local level as well. I, I couldn't agree with you more, um, particularly in big states like California. Uh, our economies are regional in nature. So those regions should be getting together now. And if I have anything to say to anybody listening, particularly if you're in a community college in a four-year regional uh, university, that conversation needs to start happening now with your employer partners, industry partners, with your local electeds, with state uh, officials. How are we going to align our efforts to make sure that we have the opportunity to put those dollars into motion and that they serve you know, workers who need access to those kinds of careers, those kinds of jobs. So this is a great opportunity, as you mentioned, Matt, great opportunity for communities, not just to build their economy, but to build their economies in a more equitable way and to really try to solve for some of the challenges that we know have been going on since the pandemic. A, a lot of disenfranchised workers, a lot of people who are underemployed. These are great paying jobs and, and hopefully we can, we can see uh, these efforts uh, begin to rise in communities and you know, with people like you helping, hopefully we can make that happen. Definitely. Really important and a win-win for the mm -hmm. learners and communities, but also for higher education at a time when, as I mentioned earlier, there are people questioning the value proposition there. What a great way to prove the value of, of of higher education and greater, no greater way than to say it's setting our learners up for success in the economy and it's helping to grow our economy in our, in our local regions. That's kind of exactly where we need to, to be. So, um, we're going to keep leaning in on that all we can. Great. So let me ask you one more question as we get, begin to wrap up. We've talked a lot about what's going on throughout uh, the country and in different states. Let's talk about your work. Let's talk about ESG uh, before we wrap up. So tell us a little bit about ESG and what kind of work are you getting engaged in in different states? And if people, uh, local state policymakers or leaders in different states are thinking about uh, getting help on these issues on how to effectively and efficiently put these dollars to work, what kind of work do you do to, to support those efforts? We, we are lucky enough to do work all across the country on this. I founded a education strategy group about 11 years ago at this point, as, as you mentioned, having come out of the, the federal government in the Obama administration and, and seeing the needs in the field. And all of our work has been focused on the intersections between education and what comes next. Uh, right. So we are working with, we've been working in over 30 states in one form or another on helping to scale quality pathways from education to careers. Some of that begins as early as, you know, high school. Uh, a lot of it is focused on colleges and higher education. We help shape policies at the state level that create the enabling conditions to uh, better scale these kinds of programs and support institutions that are serious about uh, growing their pathways. We're working at the local level in a number of places around the country to help grow these programs. And almost all of our work, we're bringing employers together with education institutional leaders to try to build these partnerships. So we have a big emphasis on setting these tables that we were talking about earlier, creating these mm -hmm. partnerships, understanding um, that there's a there needs to be kind of a translation that goes on between uh, industry and employers and the education systems. So each can understand each other's needs and you can kind of bridge that gap. We have a fair amount of work, frankly, in helping support intermediary, intermediary organizations that are sitting at the intersection of education institutions and 
employers and industry. In higher education in particular, we've done a lot of work with community colleges to help them grow their pathways uh, in specific sectors. A lot of work even in helping to look at how you support um, learners of color and low-income learners in community mm -hmm. colleges, how you look at workforce programs that are traditionally been separate from credit-bearing programs in community colleges and start to break down the barriers between the two so there's greater stackability and greater efficiencies built in colleges. Uh, and then we're at doing a fair amount of work looking at the larger questions of how you measure the success of higher education. Mm -hmm. Working at a few states and a few national partners on how do we measure the return on investment in higher education? And there's a lot of energy and appetite right now, as you know, to move from just looking at attainment um, to looking at attainment and return on that investment on connection with career outcomes. So I think that's a, a space that will continue to grow in the future. And we're, we're really happy to be right at the center of helping folks figure that out. Well, it sounds like you were in the right place at the right time, whether intentional or by accident. I mean, this is definitely a time where every community, every state, every family, every learner is thinking about how to increase their return on their investment in post-secondary education and, and how that links to a good paying job, uh, a chance for a career, uh, a chance to pay for the increasing cost of living in states like California, Texas, Florida, New York, and others. So really appreciate the work that you're leading, Matt. And I also really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here on The Rant. So again, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure, Eloy. Thanks so much for having me. Keep up the great work. All right. Well, you've been listening to my conversation with Matt Gandalf. It's been great having him here to talk about the CHIPS Act and many other issues that are impacting states and communities in terms of building the workforce for tomorrow. If you like this episode, please hit the like button, uh, continue to follow us on this YouTube channel, and of course, continue to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. 